this week. We have a treat because as soon as I'm finished, and I will try to finish promptly, uh, Dick Bowden, who is sitting behind me, will do the banjo presentation, and I guarantee you it will be a rewarding and educational experience. Um, so last week I mentioned that bluegrass became a genre and uh, actually acquired the name bluegrass during the 1950s uh, as bands, other bands like Flatt and Scruggs and the Stanley Brothers and Jimmy Martin and the Osborne Brothers, Jim and Jesse, all sort of began to sort of pick up and follow uh, loosely in the mold that Monroe had set in the 1940s with Flatt and Scruggs and Chubby Wise in the band. Um, also, during the 1950s and the early 1960s, there were bands like the Weavers and the Kingston Trio that entered the top 40, the pop charts, with slick arrangements of old folk songs. And these two groups kindled an interest in older forms of folk music, and the banjo in particular, which featured prominently in both groups. Here's a little clip from the Kingston Trio. It's one of their big hits from the late 50s, uh, MTA. <laughs> I think the Kingston Trio were probably uh, more Calypso than Bluegrass, but it does sound to me like uh, Dave Gard had been listening to Earl Scruggs when he recorded that. And um, Tony Trishka, who was one of the banjo virtuosos uh, of, of contemporary music, uh, I believe has said that he was inspired to take up the banjo after hearing that banjo solo on the Kingston Trio record. Um, so in any case, groups like the Kingston Trio kindled an interest in, in that style of music, music featuring the banjo. And bluegrass was enthusiastically adopted into the folk revival, by, especially by younger northern and urban musicians who viewed it as more authentic than the popular music of the time and perhaps more commercial sounding folk music. So um, the band that really was sort of the, the first beneficiary of this trend was Flat and Scruggs. They were probably during the, ninth, the late 1950s and early 60s, the most popular bluegrass band in America. And their renown became such that in 1962, they played at Carnegie Hall, um, which was, I think, unprecedented for bluegrass musicians. Um, and they also recorded that same year the theme music for a popular CBS TV program called the Beverly Hillbillies. Um, that theme song spread the bluegrass sound throughout the country every week. And in addition to playing the theme song, uh, Flatt and Scruggs had guest appearances on several episodes so people could actually see them perform as well as hear the theme music. So this is a little clip from the Beverly Hillbillies. TV show, for some reason, Lester Flatt, who sing, was singing in that video clip, was not the vocalist. Uh, the, the CBS had somebody else sing the, the lyric, um, but uh, Flatt and Scruggs recorded it and had a hit with it as well. Um, so bluegrass was beginning to sort of enter pop culture at that time in a big way via TV and also via movie soundtracks. Um, Flatt and Scruggs' recording of the fiery banjo instrumental Foggy Mountain Breakdown uh, which Lester and Earl had recorded, I believe, in 1949, was adopted um, for the soundtrack of the movie Bonnie and Clyde by Warren Beatty, who was the star of that movie. Uh, <coughs> Beatty had grown up in Washington, D.C. He was a musician. He was familiar with bluegrass. And he wanted something to supercharge some of the chase scenes in the soundtrack. So he used uh, Lester and Earl's original recording of Foggy Mountain Breakdown, which again uh, became a pop hit uh, in the late 60s as a result. No, 
notice I focused more on the, the Dobro. The <laughs> yes, Dick, Dick noticed that. Um, Uncle Josh, the Dobro player in Flat and Scruggs Band. This is like a little preview for my presentation on the Dobro, which is uh, going to be next week, next Friday. Um, but uh, Uncle Josh got to share in some of the glory on Foggy Mountain Breakdown, although he wasn't in the band when Lester and Earl originally recorded it. So the soundtrack version of Foggy Mountain Breakdown that uh, it was included in Bonnie and Clyde uh, doesn't have the benefit of Uncle Josh's splendid Dobro licks. The other uh, movie soundtrack that, that uh, really put bluegrass and, and the, the banjo uh, front and center was uh, the, the tune Dueling Banjos, which was composed by Don Reno, uh, another five-string banjo virtuoso of the day and popular band leader with the Reno and Smiley Band, recorded by Reno and, and another banjoist in the 1950s under the title Feudin Banjos. Uh, it was adopted uh, for the movie Deliverance and appeared on the, in the soundtrack of that movie and also in the soundtrack album. Uh, performed by Eric Weisberg, who is uh, one of the, the, I guess you'd call him folk revival banjo players. He was a banjo virtuoso. Uh, he was, uh, I believe, Juilliard trained musician. Um, and he did a lot of session work in, in New York City, including this. And also, I believe, he appeared on John Denver's recording of uh, Take Me Home Country Roads. Um, anyway, we'll have a little bit of, uh, of that. You're probably familiar with this as well. It sort of happened around the same time in, in, in the, in the, during the folk revival period that I wanted to mention was the rise of what's been called the Bluegrass Festival movement. Um, so the Newport Folk Festival had been around since the late 1950s and it had attracted large crowds of folk music fans to Newport, Rhode Island. Um, some of the bluegrass people were paying attention and thought that a, a festival dedicated to bluegrass music would be a good idea, a multi-day event held in a rural setting. Um, where people could get together and celebrate the, the music of Bill Monroe and the other great bluegrass bands. Um, and the first one, the first multi-day bluegrass festival was held in 1965 in Virginia. Um, the concept quickly took off and to the point very early on by the 70s there were many of these festivals happening all over uh, the United States and they continue to be uh, a major part of bluegrass music uh, and, and related types of music today. Uh, there are a number of uh, really great bluegrass festivals uh, that are not too far from this area. Um, I, would it be okay to mention a couple of them? Yeah. The Gray Fox Bluegrass Festival, which is in July, uh, in Oak Hill, New York, which is in uh, northwest Greene County in the Catskills. Uh, Old Tone uh, Roots Music Festival, which covers a lot of ground besides bluegrass. Uh, it's got old time music and, and uh, uh, Dixieland and, and lots of other uh, great roots musics. Uh, in Columbia County at the, the Cool Whisper Farm. Uh, a little further afield uh, in uh, northeastern Vermont is a festival called Jenny Brook, which is uh, the last week <coughs> of June. Um, these are just three that are relatively nearby. I say relatively, Jenny Brook is several hours from here. Um, but they give you a, a sense of, of what music is like. And one of the, for, for me, one of the most enjoyable aspects of all of these festivals are sort of what they call parking lot jam sessions or after hour jam sessions or field picking where people, musicians, sometimes musicians who know each other, sometimes people who've just met get together and uh, play music for the fun of it in jam sessions. And the last clip is actually <laughs> uh, from a, an old time festival, but I thought it captured the atmosphere really well. It's contemporary. And what I like about it is um, that it features um, two instrumental virtuosos uh, fiddle virtuoso, um, old time fiddle virtuoso named Bruce Malski, who actually lives in this area, he lives in Beacon, uh, and a, a, an old time banjo <coughs> player named Allison DeGroote, who is uh, a, a woman uh, playing the banjo, and she's a terrific banjoist, uh, and a lot of young women uh, fiddle players who are sitting in and playing with these two masters. And I thought it was it was nice to see <coughs> that this kind of music or similar type of music relate is is something that that young people can relate to. So I just thought I'd close out my part of the presentation t this week with a little clip from, from uh, an old time jam session at Clifftop. Mm -hmm. 
captures the, the flavor of what one of those things is like when it's, when it's really going well. Um, and you may or may not remember in the first class I was playing some tunes by old time fiddle players from Kentucky who maybe could give a little bit of a sense of what uh, Uncle Penn might have sounded like had he been recorded. And one of the old timers was John Salyer whose tune that was. Um, yes? Um, I hope this is okay. Oh sure. Um, if your favorite part of bluegrass festivals is the jamming, and you're not really into tenting. There's also Jam Vember, which is the weekend before Thanksgiving, and it takes place in a hotel um, just outside Boston. That's terrific. Okay. It's was all jamming. No, all no, no concerts, right? No concerts, just yeah. jamming. Okay. Jam Vember? This is the same place as Joe Oh, it's in, in Framingham at the, yeah, at the yeah. hotel. Okay, great. And people go um, just to listen. Yeah, I go just to listen. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's a, some web, something on the website, or, or yeah, is that a Boston like Bluegrass like Union thing? Or, or? Jam Denver. Okay, Jam Denver. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, with that, I am very pleased to be able to turn the program over to Dick Bowden, master banjoist and bluegrass historian extraordinaire. <laughs> Thank you, Andy, for those uh, wonderful words, which I wrote. <laughs> and, uh, I'm delighted to be here. I'm delighted that you're here. And as John Hartford said many times, I'm delighted we're all here at the same time. So this is great. There is no higher calling in education than learning about the banjo and bluegrass music. So this is probably the peak of your educational experience. <laughs> Pat yourselves on the back in a big way. I am not a scholar of music, uh, I'm not a scholar of the banjo. Uh, by training, I'm an engineer, I'm retired now, but I've been playing the banjo since I was, well I've been fooling with the banjo since I was eight or nine years old and I started playing it seriously. When I was 11, uh, I grew up in Maine and uh, when I was almost 11 I got to see Flatt and Scruggs in person at a music park in uh, Pennsylvania completely changed my life. I'd been playing the guitar up until that point, old folk style guitar, and I saw Lester and Earl and uh, that was it. My dad had a banjo, which I was not allowed to touch, and he worked shift work in a factory, so when he was gone, I was touching the banjo like crazy. <laughs> and eventually I got passable enough on it, he said, okay, take, take the banjo. I, I can't do it, you do it. So my talk today is from the viewpoint of a lifelong banjo picker, bluegrass picker. In later years, I got interested in what bluegrass people call the dark side, which is old time music. There are warnings against going to the dark side. So. But I, I love old time music and that little clip there at the end was really great. Question? The next time you give this presentation, yes, for his memory, you really need to put a little piece on Pete Seeger in there. Don't get ahead, please. There's no extra credit for getting ahead. <laughs> put it in quick, Lynn. It's an old time music versus bluegrass. What is old time versus bluegrass? Yeah. I'll talk about that a little bit, but it's really more in Andy's uh, presentation about what is bluegrass. But bluegrass evolved from old time music. Old time music is older. I have a recording from 1944 where the band leader says, now we'd like to do some old time music for our old time friends. In 1944, old time music was a thing. In those days, it probably meant music before recordings that just was played by their grandfathers. And then others would say, no, it's before radio started to popularize music of all kinds. So it's, it's kind of before there were records made in one way or another, it was just people playing. Bluegrass by comparison 
was influenced by what I call four different streams, one of which was Dixieland Jazz, which was very performance oriented and soloist oriented. You had a band, but there were at least three or maybe four or five members of the band who would step out and take solos. And they'd step back, somebody else would step. Old time music, everybody plays all the time, 100%. There are no solos in old time music. Bluegrass is more performance influenced, definitely caught the bug from jazz music in New Orleans and Chicago. And it's very big on soloists playing as hot as they can play, as different as they can make it. Old time music is much more focused on we're all going to play the same notes together. We're going to learn this song as a family, and this family is always going to play this song the same way. So that's the short answer. I hope that's enough. But uh, speaking of the banjo, the banjo comes from Africa. The banjo was appropriated by white people in America out of admiration and fascination with the music that came out of it. This painting right here is the oldest known image of an early, early banjo. This painting comes from around the 1780s. It's unattributed. This is a very early banjo, and in fact, the banjo fraternity nowadays, and there is one, doesn't even call that a banjo. They call it a gourd lute. The body of it is made from a gourd, a melon or a pumpkin. You know, when you take gourds and dry them out, you can rattle them and do things with them. Well, they would take gourds and dry them out, cut the top off, and tack on a piece of some animal skin. Cat, dog, squirrel, possum, raccoon, whatever they might have, and there are lots of animal skins around when you live from hunting and farming. That would be tacked on there to make a little drum. So basically, it's a drum with a stick literally shoved through it. It's just poked through the gourd. The strings were made out of horse hairs, hand twined together. And that is an accurate picture of an early, early banjo. And it even has this little short string right up here that makes it a five string. Now there's some argument about when the fifth string actually appeared, but this, this picture has three up on the top part, but it does have the little short one. And all banjos that eventually became five, all have the little short one on the side. So I don't, I don't think this even has a formal title, but it's generally known as plantation imagery of, of the banjo. So then it evolved a little bit more. The next picture, please, Lynn. This painting comes from the late 1890s, and at that time was considered a nostalgia painting, a nostalgic painting, not historically accurate. The title of this is The Banjo Lesson. This banjo has evolved into the shop made instead of homemade banjo. And it is a five string. If you get the right light, you can see the little short string on the side. So those are some old time images of banjos by their original players of banjos. And let's see what the next one says. This is the instrument that sort of precedes it from Africa, West Africa. It's called, there are others, by the way, with different names. This one's known as the Akunting. You see it's got a a gourd or a turtle shell or something with a skin stretched over it, a stick poked through it, and this one has uh, three strings on it. And some of these, the player didn't even use his left hand at all. It was like a harp attached to a, a, a drum. And you just picked the various strings with one hand as you would a harp. And the little gourd with the head on it is an amplifying thing. It just makes it louder. And it's portable. You can make it any time. If you remember the television show Roots, huge phenomenon back in the, what, 80s, I guess? The way that Kunta Kinte got captured in the first episode by the slavers was, according to family lore, he went into the bushes to get a gourd to make a ko. That's the word that was used in that book by Alex Haley. To get a gourd to make a ko. Clearly, that's what they're talking about. These things were seen in the Caribbean in the 1600s. I think the notation I have is Jamaica. I might be wrong about that. But uh, a visitor to Jamaica from Europe saw the slaves playing this thing and made note of it. And the name pretty universally at that time, even in the 1600s and 1700s, was the Banjar, 
or Banjar, something like that. So we can go ahead a little bit. That's another gourd banjo from the Caribbean. You see the familiar gourd. You see the fifth, the little short string on the side. This one has three strings up here, so it's a four string banjo, but it does have the little short one. The little short one is a drone string. It always plays the same note all the time, over and over and over. Same note, same note, like bagpipes. Have a drone, plays the same note all the time. Banjo uses the same thing. So, some other historical mentions. Oh, uh, uh, the uh, slaves in America had the same instruments. And I used the words earlier, admiration and fascination and appropriation. Uh, white people loved the sound of the banjo. And it was usually accompanied by dancing of some kind. And a German music professor was visiting New Orleans in the early 1800s, and he saw a slave's Sunday music making, big jam session, dance party. And he actually was able to capture the notes he was hearing and write them down. That's the first written sheet music of the banjo. It was about 1810. And again, fascination. What a, this is wonderful. It's like all music, anything new and different that catches your ear. And if it's not too complicated, if you think you can figure it out, that makes it more fascinating. Also in 1743, newspaper in New York City, it's just recently been discovered in this uh, newspaper, was discovered someplace by a scholar who's really digging into the banjo. 1743, there was an ad for an escaped slave, and it said he can be identified because he carries a banjo and plays it very well. <laughs> so that's, you know, one of the earliest recorded American instances. So, white boys around the farm, around the plantation, whatever might be the right word for it, fascinated by this music, it's pretty approachable, it's not too difficult, started wanting to learn to play these instruments. So they wanted to build these instruments. And they didn't necessarily build them out of gourds by that time, they had access to things like cheese boxes and uh, meal sieves, which is a round hoop with a screen in it, and they would take those and turn them into banjos, borrowing the principles. There was a farm boy, oh, they would take these homemade banjos and get various jobs, and the first job that's been recorded by a white man playing a banjo was in a circus, and it became a popular uh, between the acts diversion at the circus to have a banjo player and what we would call a tap dancer or a soft shoe dancer. They always went together. The banjo would play, the tap dancer would dance. And it could be a white man and a black man, white man playing the banjo, black man dancing, and reverse, two white men, two black men. It was all kind of interchangeable at those times. The focus was on here's some music between the acts. Came quite popular and a number of people saw this and liked it and in particular a farm boy from Appomattox, Virginia named Joel Sweeney. He was fascinated by this. He built himself several banjos, even a left-handed one for his sister, even in those days. This is in the 1830s, 1840s. And he's the one who kind of standardized it, four strings up here, and the fifth one is the short one over there, and that's where the five-string banjo, everybody acknowledges he's the guy who made it popular. Not only did he build them, but he went and played in circuses. He played uh, in the Civil War with some Southern General's music uh, band. He and his brother were attached to some general or other and played for their entertainment. But what he really did, he went into the East Coast cities and he came to New York. And New York City has a huge role in the banjo, exploding into popularity. He got with three other fellows. One played the fiddle, one played the tambourine, and one played the bones, which are literally rib bones. Maybe you've seen people put them in their hands and clack them back and forth for rhythm. It's kind of a lost art now, but there are a few. And they formed this band, and they called themselves the Virginia Minstrels. And out of what I believe at that time was admiration, and fascination, they played the plantation songs. And I 
hesitate to go too deep into it, but they painted themselves up in blackface, and that was the beginning of blackface. Although blackface originated in Europe in the theater, not in America, but they put on blackface, and we'll play these old, they call them old familiar southern plantation melodies. Most of them they made up, but some of them had a basis in what they'd heard. Well, who knew it? In literally one year in New York City, this music exploded quicker than rock and roll. And pretty soon, every theater in New York had a minstrel show of some kind. And these minstrel bands just, just grew exponentially. Within one year, these minstrel bands were touring England and Scotland and Ireland and playing for the king and queen. It's been the fastest explosion of a new kind of music that ever happened. And the bands got bigger than four people. They eventually became eight, nine, ten people. They started doing comic routines and jokes and skits. And it turned into two other kinds of music. Ragtime, the early kind of banjo music that was played very syncopated and kind of slow and really fit tap dancing or, or soft shoe dancing. And uh, that became ragtime. Those rhythms became ragtime. And the jokes and skits part of it became vaudeville. And I'll pause right here. I did this talk for Marist College two years ago. It's being videoed back there, and it got on the internet. And I was torn to pieces by a banjo scholar who really scolded me. I emphasized all the wrong things. I didn't say the right names. I was dabbling in history. I have no business talking about. So. If you're watching, you come here and do the talk. <laughs> I didn't, I knew better than to get in a flame war. I just ignored it, but it's still, anyway. So, let's see what the next one is. This may be, yes, this is a tune played by modern day recreators of old time, really old time banjo from the 1840s and 50s. Take it away because I can't remember how it goes now. <laughs> Jackie, please, dance with that. Yes, question? How much of this music can you trace, and do you have any examples back to the Scots-Irish heritage that they brought over into the mountains with them? It's actually easier for that later in the 1800s, post-Civil War. Uh, this music is not necessarily Scots-Irish, although it turned out that a lot of banjo player, tap dancer, buskers in New York City, especially the Bowery, extremely well known. If you remember uh, Gangs of New York by Martin Scorsese, is that right? He actually has some of that in the Bowery taking place at the Five Points. That exact kind of old plunky banjo and a tap dancer with a hat out. It was, it was extremely common. And it's, uh, it's not Scots-Irish at all until later on when the fiddle begins to predominate. Because the fiddle as opposed to violin playing fiddle, really was heavily influenced by Irish sheet music. Dick, was that really a sousaphone in the background? Or a I think it was a regular tuba, but I'm not an expert, and it's, it's not filled in somebody's house. Up but that, you see that in Dixieland. The early Dixieland always had a tuba, and then eventually became a bass fiddle, but the tuba is a marching band instrument. So, Anyway, I'm going to, I think we have one more picture here. This is the modern uh, shop made banjo. It's no longer made out of a gourd. It's made in a shop. It's not homemade. Uh, I have one here. This was made about 20 years ago in Virginia. It has metal on it. The head is not nailed on. It's put on by the same thing. Uh, the early makers were drum shops. They made drums. This is exactly how a drum is built. There's a metal band here and these tightening screws pull the pull the head tight so it will do its job. You know, this is that's a drum, right? With a stick on it with strings to amplify the strings. 
But I'm going to attempt to play one little piece that comes from back in those pre-Civil War days. There's no back to that. Correct. And they didn't at the time. This song is called, and I'm terrible at this, it's very hard for me to, to play this. I've only been working on this for about 10 years. See how low it sounds? This is a modern banjo. This has metal strings, this has gut strings, made from sheep intestines. This is called Essence of Old Virginia with Apologies. <clears throat> and you'll notice how slow it is. to this day, uh, white and black, who work on these old styles and are very, very good at it. And one thing that's unusual about the, the old style of banjo, all of it got written down in sheet music. And you can go to libraries, and it's all reprinted now, but you can find every song that was played in those days. In addition to playing it on stage, they sold sheet music for income. So all these old songs, if you want to do them, you can learn them. Yes, question? That tuba that we saw. Yep. I'm going to throw a theory out at you. I have no idea. But after the Civil War, and this happened to Louis Armstrong, he picked up his first cornet from a hawk shop. The southern guys who were playing in the bands had no money. They sold all their instruments. Yeah. There's no such thing as a bass fiddle in a marching band in the right. Civil War, but there probably were tubas. And maybe they ended up in the hop shops, and that was the first way to get to get a base a base added to your to your group. Uh, this particular picture, the uh, banjo has frets on it, and frets come from the guitar world. This banjo is considered pretty primitive. It has no frets, so you, it's like a violin. And he plays a butcher finger. You get a note that's not necessarily a note the piano can play. It slides up and down a lot, so no frets or fretless. The picture there shows a banjo with frets. Also has a lot of decorations, you see. It's got stars and dots and things in it. These were made all up and down the East Coast by drum shops, guitar shops, fiddle shops. The banjo was wildly popular, and everybody wanted a banjo. Uh, Joel Sweeney, they think, eventually turned over his banjo design to a drum maker in Baltimore. And Banjos were made at this shop in Baltimore that anybody could buy. There was a huge banjo company in New York City that turned out banjos from dirt cheap to, you know, very nice. Another famous banjo company was in Philadelphia. And they tended to focus on really nice banjos. And they, they in all the catalogs after the Civil War said, we're elevating the banjo. We're not going to play those rude melodies anymore. We're going to play fine music that ladies and gentlemen will listen to in evening dress. And they made it work. And, and that's another whole stream of banjo playing called classical banjo. Uh, Philadelphia, Boston. Boston had a huge banjo making uh, establishment up there. Several companies. Connecticut, Vermont, other places in New York, Ohio. The banjo was so popular, everybody wanted it. Okay. Now we're going to start getting closer to bluegrass. Uh, the minstrel show dominated American show business for, I don't know, 60, 70 years. And uh, nowadays it's, it's frowned on, exploit, I don't know the correct word, exploitative or exploitive, I don't know. But uh, you don't really see them anymore. You can find people who play it and make records of it, which is considered, I guess, slightly more acceptable. But 
This fellow here, Uncle Dave Macon, uh, was born after the Civil War in, in Tennessee, I think 1880 or something like that. And he learned all of these streams of banjo playing. The circus players, he personally learned to play the banjo from a fellow who played in a circus. He grew up around Nashville. He was a city boy, in fact. His parents owned a hotel in Nashville where the steamboat orchestras, you know, and performers used to stay in the hotel. And he learned all these things. And he learned, he learned to play classical. He learned to play hillbilly like the, the folks out in the mountains were just kind of scrubbing away accompanying the fiddle. The fiddler was the good musician who, you know, really knew all the notes. And the banjo just kind of kept, kept along for accompaniment. But he learned all those styles. He also learned all the singing and the jokes and the poems and the religious sayings, and he had a complete one-man show. He could hold people for a couple hours on the courthouse steps between playing and telling jokes and stories and all that. That's a picture of him as a young man. Obviously, that's a shop-made banjo. You see a lot of metal around the rim of it. It has frets on it. And uh, he was an expert banjo player, but even more than that, he was an expert entertainer. He was the first star of the Grand Ole Opry. He went on their second program in 1925. The first program was just an old fiddler, an old gentleman with a big white beard, and he played for an hour or so, and they got buried in telegrams. People just couldn't believe it. This was great. He was on the second program with his banjo, telling jokes, singing songs, reciting poetry, generally raising hell. He was a hell raiser. He drank pretty hard, but he was a wonderful entertainer. So there's Uncle Dave. Let's see what we got next. Here's some video of Uncle Dave in about 1940 in his old age. A bunch of fellows from the Grand Ole Opry drove to Hollywood and made a movie. Uncle Dave was featured in it. That's his son accompanying him. Uncle Dave played till 1953 on the Grand Ole Opry, way into his 80s uh, when he died. But he was known as the Grand Ole Man of the Grand Ole Opry, and people just could not get enough of Uncle Dave. And I'm fortunate enough to know a couple of young fellows down in Tennessee and Alabama who have really studied Uncle Dave. And they knew an old man in Tennessee that Uncle Dave taught back in the 30s and 40s. And he had Uncle Dave's material. He was never a professional entertainer, he was a farmer. But he had all that stuff down cold. And he taught it to them. And I've stole this, stolen this from one of them or two of them. Two things always true about a banjo player. You'll never make any money. And you'll never be in tune. <laughs> This is the old familiar tune called My Grandfather's Clock. Oh, my grandfather's clock was too large for the shell, so it stood 90 years on the floor. Yes, sir, it was taller by half than the old man himself, though it weighed not a penny weight more. It was bought on the morn of the day that he was born. It was his pleasure and pride, but it stopped short, never to go again when the old man died. Ninety years without slumbering, his life second slumbering. It stopped short, never to go again when the I know four people in the country who can do that well, four. One fellow's in Pennsylvania, one's in Alabama, one's in Tennessee, two, and two are in Tennessee. And they can do that all night long, and you wouldn't believe the repertoire of 
everything that goes into that. So that's Uncle Dave. He was really, that's old time. And he had every banjo style in existence. He could play it. He made 200 and some records, 78 records, one of which was about coming to New York City to make a record, a meta record. And he talked about his trouble on the subway and the barbers charged too much. And all that. These two boys on either side, Sam is on the left, Kirk is on the right. When they were really young men, they accompanied Uncle Dave on his road show. And they would play the guitar, the fiddle, or other banjos with him, whatever was needed. And they're on a number of his records in the 1920s. They became their own band. They're called Sam and Kirk McGee, the boys from sunny Tennessee. Next one. This fellow here, his name is Charlie Poole. He's considered a huge influence on bluegrass, banjo. He was playing in the 1920s. He was a terrible drunk, and he poisoned himself with alcohol and died about 1930 or 31. But he made a few records that sold very, very high numbers. Uh, the most famous one was called Can I Sleep in Your Barn Tonight, Mister? Huge hit, sold hundreds of thousands of copies. He wasn't a, no, where's my banjo? He wasn't a particularly great banjo player, but I've listened to all of his recordings. He, he could play, but it, he, he only made, I think, one or two solos out of 50 or 60 records he made. He only played one or two solos. He plays a Gibson banjo up there that has a back plate on it. This is called a resonator. And what it does is it really projects the sound out the front instead of being buried in my stomach. So this <coughs> is loud. Very loud. Very loud. And he played one of these. He didn't play it very fancy or very hot, but because his records were so popular, and he did a lot of personal appearances around the Virginias and Carolina and Kentucky and Tennessee, I guess. He's from North Carolina. A lot of young fellows in the 1930s and 20s listening to these records wanted to do that. So let's see what the next one is after Charlie Poole. Here's one of them, roughly the same age. He was a religious man, didn't drink, and he lived to be over 100. His name is Wade Maynard. You notice he has a banjo almost identical to the one I picked up here. This is the same model. This is the same brand, Gibson, and the same model. It's a master tone. It's kind of decked out in gold and really pretty wood, and it was made for show in addition to its sound. And that kind of comes from Dixieland and jazz. They did some things with the banjo starting in about 1910. They started taking strings off it. And they wanted, instead of picking it, they just wanted to play it with a flat pick like it was a guitar. And it was a rhythm instrument for Dixieland. And every Dixieland band had a banjo in the 1910s. And the first one that had just four strings on it was even called the tango banjo because it was used in the first tango bands. Tango waltz, tang, uh, tang, tango dance, tango band, tango banjo. Now it's known as the tenor banjo, but then it was called. And then they made, well, let's make one that plays just like a guitar, okay? So they called that the plectrum banjo. It has four strings on it. You strum it with a pick, just like you were playing a guitar. Also used for Dixieland and swing music and big band music, dance bands, really like these banjos you could strum. And they liked them to be pretty. They liked them to be gold. They put rhinestones all over them. They put electric lights inside the head with crude wiring, you know, wired, you know, hand wired into the wall. So inside the head there were colors. And that's why these banjos got so pretty. That kind of sprang from Dixieland, jazz, swing bands, dance bands. But by about 1930, certainly, the banjo was dead in that music. The guitar just stepped right in, took it over. But nobody played the banjo. All the banjo players got rid of their banjos and took up guitars. Boy, I gotta move. So that's why these banjos get so pretty. Now here's an old fella, Grandpa Jones. We're getting up into the 1940s now. He grew up in show business in the 1930s playing on radio, as did Wade Maynard. He played on radio all through the 30s and made records. Grandpa, he's from uh, uh, Louisville, Kentucky. As a very young man, like 19, they dressed him up in a mustache and powdered his hair and called him Grandpa because he was a grouch. And he was, he was a grouch his whole life. 
He's famous for beating his car because it stalled in an intersection in Nashville, like Basil Falvey. But he sang com all comic songs. And he just kind of banged away on the five-string banjo for, to accompany his voice. He became very, very popular in the 40s and 50s. He was a member of the Grand Ole Opry. If you remember the TV show Hee Haw, mm -hmm. he was a standard member of the show on Hee Haw. He did jokes and recipes. What's for dinner, Grandpa? You remember that? And he'd give these ridiculous country recipes for possum and coon cooked with a sweet potato and all this stuff. But anyway, that's Grandpa. That's shots from a TV show. Here's an <laughs> the ultimate entertainer around this time, World War II, the 1940s of the old style of banjo. This fellow is known as String Bean, the Kentucky Wonder. He's from up in the mountains of Kentucky, not a city boy at all. All he would eat, he hated beef and milk, said he wouldn't have it in the house. He ate hog, potatoes, cornmeal, and white lightning, pretty much, was what String survived on. Buy a barrel of flour every few months for his wife. Never learned to drive, but he had a new Cadillac every year because he made just enough money for that. He was very happy. String is an eyeful. Go ahead. <laughs> String was, and his wife were murdered in 1973 by a couple of layabouts in Nashville who thought that the rumors about him carrying his entire life savings in the pocket of his bib overall was true. <clears throat> it wasn't true, but they shot him anyway. Those boys have uh, served a long time in the Crossbar Hotel down there in Tennessee. And they're safer in there than they are on the street, I'll tell you that, because everyone on the Grand Ole Opry would gladly exchange his life to get a hold of those guys. So the last one I want to talk about in the pre-bluegrass banjo players who grew up in records, radio, Grand Ole Opry. Uh, this fellow here was with the number one band on the Grand Ole Opry as a kind of featured entertainer. He's from up in the mountains of East Tennessee, up near Dollywood, where he lived. There was no road. When they wanted to go into the general store or something, they had to walk down the creek bed, literally. His father was a moonshiner. When this guy was five years old, he used to take a wagon of moonshine down to town and sell it for his old man because nobody would bother a kid. Brother Oswald was his stage name. He was in Roy Acuff's band, and Roy Acuff was the number one star of the Grand Ole Opry all through World War II in the 40s. And when they wanted a little comic relief or a little lighthearted entertainment, they'd call, Oswald, come out here with your five-string banjo. Brother Oswald, hey, <laughs> look at that. <laughs> well, I, I guess I am the best bandy picker I ever heard in my life. <laughs> Get the same key, boys. <laughs> well, it is the way down Columbus. He knew Uncle Dave Macon and he adopted all the jokes and the costume and the foolishness and all that. And I'm so happy. I got to meet Brother Oswald and I got to play with him. He was a very frail old man at the time, but he was just so full of comedy and entertainment and laughs and, and you just couldn't keep him down. I remember helping him get into it. He was so frail he couldn't climb into a, a, a Cono line van on his own. I had to help him in the van. But he went to a recording session and played and sang. Just a wonderful, wonderful guy. And he used to host jam sessions at his house several times a year. And all the professional musicians would come and uh, just have a big time. He and his wife were wonderful people. Very funny man and a terrific musician. 
and his main instrument was the Hawaiian guitar, the dobro, which he learned from a Hawaiian at a Chevy factory in Detroit. <laughs> That's true. Uh, so here's the last guy. This guy is kind of the breaking point between old time music where he kind of bang way down from the Georgia on the back in Tennessee. That kind, which is kind of accompanying yourself while you sing. This guy put on picks. He played on the radio. He never made many records, but he's extremely popular on radio. He was from Columbia, South Carolina. And these picks had been invented for the Hawaiian guitar, which was a huge fad that started around 1900. And you know the first folk music record that was made by a recording company like Victor or whoever? The first folk music record was Hawaiian music. Way before blues, way before hillbilly fiddling, Hawaiian music in the 19 teens. They used to wear these picks so you could hear these guitars. They just weren't very loud at the time. Well, some banjo players said, well, that would make me louder when I play on the radio in Columbia, South Carolina. So Snuffy Jenkins was the first guy to use these picks. You'll notice he's playing one of these banjos, like uh, mine. It's a Gibson master tone, like Charlie Poole played. It's got a lot of nice, pretty decorations in it. It's gold-plated. It's a really nice one. That fellow watching him on the left, grinning like a possum, that's Earl Scruggs, who decided to play the banjo with picks on when he was a kid in the 1930s because he heard Snuffy Jenkins over the radio. He lived about 50 miles away and could pick up that radio station. And Snuffy wasn't the only one who was picking the banjo. There were other guys doing it. Earl had a second cousin, in fact, who made a record kind of like Charlie Poole quietly picking away in the back. Can't hear it very well because he doesn't have picks on. But Snuffy could play and pick and you could hear him. And although he never made many records, he influenced just about every young fellow who owned a banjo in the 30s and 40s, including, next one, the king, the originator. Earl Scruggs invented, developed, popularized, sold, and made money on the bluegrass banjo. He's got the same model banjo there that I have, a Gibson Master Tone. That's the same one he's had since 1948, 49. It's hanging in the Country Music Hall of Fame now since he passed away. Uh, he's from North Carolina. He heard all these guys on the radio. Like I said, he had a second cousin who had made a record. The name of the record was, The Man Who Wrote Home Sweet Home Never Was a Married Man. <laughs> and in the back, like, Hand of God, I hate to do that. But in the background, you can hear this picking banjo. Pink, 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 pink. And that was Earl's second cousin or whatever. And there were two or three fellows who lived in the area. It seemed like in the Carolinas, there were a number of banjo players who would rather pick than hoil away on it, you know. That style that I, you know, like Uncle, uh, Brother Oswald was doing it called Claw Hammer. Where you hit all the strings, you know, and kind of make all the racket you can. Earl found out when he was 10 years old, 11 years old, he was sitting with his banjo. His father had had an old time banjo and his father had passed away. So he had his dad's banjo. And at that time, if there was any picking going on, they'd do it with the thumb and one finger. And they call that two finger playing. The picture we had earlier of Wade Maynard. He played with two fingers, made a lot of records that way. It sounds eh, kind of like bluegrass, but it's hippity skippity. It doesn't have the drive in it. It sounds like somebody with a game leg going down the road. Well, Earl could play that, but he put another pick on one day, and when he was 11, he's just fooling around, as you know, young boys will do. And all, he was playing an old familiar tune. You know, he didn't make it up. He's just trying to say, now how can I get that other finger in there and smooth it out? And he sat there all afternoon playing it over and over and over, and all of a sudden, it just got it. It happened. Now, Earl Scruggs is a musical genius, a very humble man, and I met Earl too, but very humble man. He says, well, it, it just came to me. And I said, that, that's what I want. It's smooth now. The genius of it is he makes three notes with three separate fingers in a measure of music that has four beats. How do you fit three notes into a four-note measure and keep everything in order? I don't know how you explain it, but that's what he did. 
So I guess every 12 notes, everything comes back to where you started, I guess. But he did that. And Earl's genius was, and his mother used to yell at him once he was developing this kind of plan. She'd say, Earl, stick to the melody. She, she was doing whatever mom would do, you know, around the house. She was an old widow, and Earl was the last kid at home with a couple of sisters, I guess. And she didn't want to hear junk, jazz. She wanted to hear the song so she could sing along with it or recognize it. And that stuck with Earl his whole life. Anything he played, the melody is in there with a lot of other notes surrounding it. And that's about as far as you can go in explaining Scruggs-style banjo in words. He joined Bill Monroe's band in 1945. Instantly, just completely blew away every other banjo act on the Grand Ole Opry. Uncle Dave Macon, Brother Oswald, Grandpa Jones, String Bean just kind of stood back like, oh my God, not only was this kind of playing new, that the melody was buried in this flurry of notes, he could play a thousand miles an hour. It was unbelievable how fast he could play. And Bill Monroe could play fast. And their fiddler could play fast. And the rest of the bands on the Grand Ole Opry used to kind of snort at him like, ah, they play too fast. Ah, yeah, that's, that's, that's terrible. They play too fast. Can't even hear what they're doing. But the audiences loved it. And there are old recordings of Earl with Bill Monroe on the Grand Ole Opry. And Earl will step up and take a fast break on the banjo, again using this soloing style that comes from Dixieland and jazz. He'd step up and play as fast as he could. The audience would, it sounds like the early uh, crowds for Elvis. It sounds exactly the same. People losing their minds. <laughs> They'd never, they all knew banjos. They knew what banjos, nobody had ever seen any banjo playing like that. So he stayed with Bill Monroe for almost three years. And he and uh, Lester Flatt, who was the guitar player with Bill Monroe, and they made records, and the records were huge hits and all that. But they noticed, Earl was the only one who'd been to high school. So Bill assigned him to take care of the ticket money. And they'd get back from a week on the road to go back on the Grand Ole Opry with this huge box of money. And they noticed they never got very much of it. It sort of disappeared into Bill Monroe's <laughs> banking account. And in 1948, Earl was tired of the, they were very busy. The band was playing every day of the week and traveling all over the place. Uh, I guess I can say this. Bill also took his girlfriend along with him in the car. She was a married woman. Her husband was a Tennessee highway patrolman. And the fellows in the band were petrified he was going to pull them over someday and kill them all. Literally, Earl has said this, it's in a book. He says, we were petrified her husband would stop us and kill us all. So Earl kind of got stressed out. He decided to quit and go home to North Carolina and stay with his mother and just be a local boy again. So a couple weeks later, Lester Flatt quit, like the magic is gone, we can't do that great music anymore. So he quit and went home to East Tennessee. And oddly enough, within about another two weeks, they'd had a meeting and decided to form their own band. And they said for the rest of their life, they never planned it that way, but they just did. So they formed their own band in 1948, Flatt and Scruggs and got all the acclaim they used to get with Bill Monroe. Basically, they didn't need Bill Monroe anymore. They were that good. And they played together for 20 years and played all those clips that Andy played for you. So Earl was so key because even though his playing was new and interesting, just like way back in the 1800s when the first banjos were heard, it's approachable. If you want to learn to play it, you can learn to play it. It's not like Paganini with the violin, like he had freakish fingers, like nobody could do what he did because he had malformed hands. Earl had regular hands, and a regular, very humble guy, you know, in the high school. And he would show people how to do it. If they said, Earl, how the heck do you do that? Well, get your banjo, you got a banjo in it. Well, he'd sit down, he'd teach him right on the spot to, to the day he died. Next picture. Pete Seeger enters in here. In 1948, he published the Little Red Book titled How to Play the Five String Banjo. And it was very much about, please excuse me, but I'm going to say Pete's general style was kind of a humma strumma style. It was to accompany singing. You know, kind of like a calm down Grandpa Jones or Brother Oswald. But Pete knew a good thing when he heard it, and he published a page or two in his little red book, 
how to play Scruggs style banjo. And for 19 years, that was the only printed material that would show you how to start playing Scruggs style banjo. Earl and his wife finally woke up in the 60s that they were missing a bonanza of book sales and they hired Bill Keith to write a book for them and they made a fortune off the book. So many banjo players said, I heard Earl Scruggs on the radio. I heard Earl Scruggs on a record. A friend of mine played a record of Flatten Scruggs. It's great. How do you do it? They went to the music store. Do you have anything that says how to play the five-string banjo? Well, we don't sell it, but I have my personal copy of Pete Seeger's book, How to Play the Five-String Banjo. And it is astounding how many people started playing Scruggs-style music in the 1950s because of Pete Seeger's book. <coughs> Pete was able to play Scruggs style, he chose not to. Maybe that's the definition of a gentleman, I don't know. But <laughs> Pete's interest was getting people to sing, and the guitar or the banjo was something to support the singing. Okay, let's go through Don Reno. Don Reno took Earl Scruggs' place in Bill Monroe's band. When Earl and Lester left to form their own group, Don Reno was from almost the same county as Earl Scruggs, I think the next county, played exactly the same way. He was also inspired by Snuffy Jenkins on the record. He had the same brand of banjo. You know, they were all Snuffy Smith acolytes, uh, Snuffy Jenkins acolytes at that time. He'd gone to see Bill Monroe in audition in 1943 to play the banjo. Bill says, pretty good, you can have the job. And Don says, well, I'm subject to the draft. I don't know if I can stay or not. 1943, a guy 18, 19 years old. He did get drafted. He served with Merrill's Marauders in China. And when he got home, he's on record as saying, I turned on the Grand Ole Opry, and what did I hear but the dulcet tones of my buddy Earl Scruggs? Like, ah, missed it. <laughs> and he did. So when Earl left, he went right up. That's him on, uh, no, that isn't him. But he went right up and got the job with Bill Monroe. Bill Monroe remembered him. And he played exactly the same as Earl Scruggs and Snuffy Jenkins. Indistinguishable people didn't hardly even know Earl had gone. He left uh, Bill Monroe after a little while, very discouraged, because he said, I'm just like Earl Scruggs. What, what's the point of me having a music career? With the, why should I even play the banjo? I sound just like Earl Scruggs. So he quit the banjo and took up the electric guitar <laughs> for about five years. And he played kind of like Chuck Berry, if you can believe it. And Chuck Berry says he listened to Bill Monroe's music and he liked what Don Reno did with his banjo and there's a lot of interchange there. Don played extremely hot jazz and swing on the banjo. He didn't take the banjo up again until after 1950, maybe 51, 52. He came back to the banjo. People basically said, I'm forming a band. Will you come play the banjo with it? Well, yeah. But by then, he had completely changed his style and he was playing electric guitar licks on the banjo. Mm -hmm. But when he wanted to, he played just like Earl Scruggs. So he was firmly in the bluegrass camp, but he added to the repertoire of banjo playing licks with all these hot soloist things that sound just like Chuck Berry, really. This fellow here on the right is named Rudy Lyle. He's from Virginia. Uh, Don Reno was from South Carolina, the same county as uh, uh, Snuffy Jenkins, I think, Spartanburg area. This fellow's from Virginia, Rudy Lyle. He'd been listening. This is 1949. He'd been listening to the radio, buying the records. As I said, Earl's playing is approachable. People can learn to do it. I'm sure Earl, Rudy Lyle went up to Earl and said, how do you do that? And Earl said, well, you got your banter? Sit down with it. And he'd show him. So Rudy Lyle came along, played for many years with Bill Monroe. That's Bill in the middle. But uh, he kept it up. He added some new flavors and He's not known as a hot banjo player, but he had some little things he did that made him different and unique, and that began to set the path. You could either study and work to be just like Earl Scruggs if you wanted to, or Bill Monroe was very open about bringing in new stuff. If you want to play some Chuck Berry licks, fine. If you want to play some other, uh, Rudy Lyle had a few licks that people call Chinese licks. I don't, they, they put you in mind of Chinese background music, and he had some things like that. Rudy Lyle gave it up in the late 50s and became an electric guitar player in a country western band, bar band. Next one. Ralph Stanley. Ralph Stanley was in the service in Europe 
1945 and 1946 with the occupation forces, he and his brother had had a band in Virginia. They lived way up in the mountains in Virginia, and they played guitar and banjo, and at that time, Ralph only played the claw hammer style like that, or with two fingers, like that. And they made a few records that way, but they heard Bill Monroe and Earl Scruggs and all those guys on the Opry and says, oh, I gotta find out how to do that. So they attempted to do it just by listening to the radio. But when Earl Scruggs left Bill Monroe, the first gig he had afterwards, Ralph Stanley's father hired Earl Scruggs to come to a concert by Ralph Stanley and his brother as a featured guest. Hey, here's the guy from the Grand Ole Opry, Earl Scruggs, come on in. So they got to the place, it was in North Carolina someplace, it was a driving rainstorm, the show was canceled. So he said, Earl, I'll drive you home. You and Ralph sit in the back seat, and Ralph says, how do you do that exactly? And in the car ride, Earl taught him to play just exactly like he did. And Ralph had a huge long career, was very wealthy from the movie, Your Brother Where Art Thou? He sang the song, Oh Death, although he didn't play the banjo. But he could play just like Earl Scruggs, but he also developed his own style, which is known nowadays as Stanley style, which I particularly like. Very mountain sounding, very spooky sounding. Not that smooth, rolling locomotive power like Earl had. See what else we have here. This fellow is from West Virginia. His name is Don Stover. And he uh, was working in the coal mines. He was a banjo player, old time banjo player with the claw hammer and all that. And uh, some friends of his from West Virginia got invited to come play on the radio in <coughs> Boston in 1950. It's either one or two. And so they, they knew this kid from back home that played the banjo in the coal mine. Said, you want to get out of the mine? Come up and play on the banjo in Boston? Well, sure, chief, whatever you say. <laughs> Glad to leave. So he stayed in Boston the rest of his life playing the banjo. He played just like Earl Scruggs, but he also had his own style and licks. And he was one of the first guys who would play both styles. He knew the Scruggs picking and the old claw hammer style. He is the man who taught me to play the claw hammer style. Wonderful fellow, he's gone now, but just a wonderful entertainer, full of jokes and high spirits and all that. Uh, he planted banjo playing in the Northeast, Don Stover. He played in a bar in Boston where the sailors and the soldiers used to go in. It was very rough, knifings, gunfights, stuff like that, fist fights, and uh, they played every night of the week, six shows a night, and went home at three in the morning. <laughs> For nothing, they were paid poverty wages. It's shameful how they managed to live, but they were from such rude origins, it's better than working in a mine. Basically, their other choice. This fellow here, Sonny Osborne, was a kid. He was 14 years old in 1952. Bill Monroe needed another banjo player because Rudy Lyle got called in the service. And his guitar player knew this kid. He was 14 at the time, played a Gibson banjo, kind of like Earl. So Bill said, sure, you take care of him, but he's in the band. Sonny Osborne has said about that experience, he says, I saw things that no 14-year-old boy should ever see. <laughs> and he was kind of sour his entire life about that experience. I think it was a rough exposure. Uh, but he became a master, master banjo playing. Playing again, the same kind of banjo I have here for you. and. Uh, put a lot of blues licks and, and uh, guitar licks, steel guitar licks, you know, into the banjo. Uh, and a great singer, he and his brother, the Osborne brothers were on the Grand Ole Opry. They were really known for their singing, but to banjo players, Sonny is known as the Chief. That's his nickname, the Chief. Great guy. He's still alive, but because his shoulder gave out, he doesn't play the banjo anymore. Next one. This young fellow came along, J.D. Crow was also about 14 or 15 years old in 1952. He's from Lexington, Kentucky. Flat and Scruggs had a radio show on Lexington, Kentucky radio. J.D. was like, oh my God, it's, it's Earl Scruggs, the guy from the Grand Ole Opry with Bill Monroe. I got, and his dad would take him down to the radio station every day in the summer. And he would sit on the floor right in front of the microphone and watch Earl do that. And he absorbed it. And like most great banjo players in bluegrass, he can play exactly like Earl Scruggs, but he's also invented a whole bunch of blues licks that he put in there 
that's his own style. Mm -hmm. So there's kind of a crow style of banjo playing, which is probably the second most popular style of banjo there is today. You've got Scruggs style and Crow probably comes next. Wildly popular and just so many banjo players play it, you can't tell them apart, which is a problem with banjo playing. That's why you need to do some things on your own. I think we have one more. Ah, Bill Keith from, from uh, New York. Bill wanted to do something, he was in Boston at the time he did this. He wanted to do something different. He also could play just like Earl Scruggs. But he knew there was an older style of banjo playing called classical banjo, where you played arpeggios and scales and things like that and played from sheet music. And there were tenor banjo players and four string banjo players who did it. And he could play the piano and he knew music theory and he says, well I can probably do this stuff on the banjo if I think about it hard enough. And there were old instruction books from back in the 1800s in fact that told how to do it. And he figured it out. And he started playing like this, and by about 1960, he learned a lot from Don Stover, by the way, but... This is Scrug style, Foggy Mountain Breakdown. Scruggs style, and he could do that, but he came up with a style that became known as melodic or chromatic, because he didn't bury the melody in rolls. He played note for note the melody, just like a piano player or a violin player would play it. One of his most famous songs was the Sailor's Hornpipe, which there is no way Earl Scruggs could play the Sailor's Hornpipe. It has too many notes in it. There's no way to, to bury it in a roll with the melody kind of hidden in it. You have to play every note and there's no chance to roll. So Bill Keith was playing this around Boston. so he could play any song like that. Even the old Bill Monroe and Flatt and Scruggs Bluegrass Standards, he'd come up to take his break and instead of sounding like Earl Scruggs, he's going all up and down the banjo. And when he would play, it was just like when Elvis or Bill Monroe or Earl Scruggs took the stage, people would lose their minds. And that whole style of playing became known as Keith style and in the 60s and 70s and 80s, it was wildly popular. It was the second most popular style after Scruggs. Bill Keith went, other, went into other kinds of music, kind of left bluegrass behind, started playing the steel guitar and other things, playing in Hollywood and, and uh, with the Grateful Dead and, and uh, the Flying Burrito Brothers and the Birds and got away from bluegrass a little bit. But uh, he was kind of considered a, a gray eminence for the banjo. If you really wanted to know the theory of how the banjo worked, both Scruggs style and his own style, very scholarly guy, very scholarly. And he trained a bunch of guys. He's gone now, but he trained a bunch of guys. We can have the next one. Bela Fleck. Bela Fleck is named for Bela Bartok. His parents, well, I hope I said that right, his parents are classical music enthusiasts, so they named him. And oddly enough, this kid with that kind of background was attracted to the Beverly Hillbillies theme. He said it many times. We'd watch the Beverly Hillbillies just to hear the banjo. And it's that fascinating aspect of the banjo, whether it's the old rude and crude aspect or the new amazing, you know, full of notes. And he took it up and he went so far beyond Bill Keith. He was instructed by a fellow from New York named Tony Trishka, taught Bela Fleck and Bela just went into outer space. The things he does with the banjo, he had a jazz band called Bella Fleck and the Fleck Tones with vibes and drums and electric bass and just did incredible things, way beyond bluegrass. Now he plays with his wife, Abigail Washburn. 
and they play two old time banjos. In fact, he plays one that's about this big across. It's a bass banjo. And he accompanies his wife and they just do this duet show. Again, way beyond bluegrass. Next one. Noam Pekelny. Noam Pekelny is the hot guy right now. He won the Banjo Player of the Year Award from the Bluegrass Association a few years ago. Uh, very intense guy from uh, uh, Chicago. He writes out all of his music, even, even bluegrass songs, even playing a Bill Monroe song. He made a whole album of Bill Monroe songs playing just as modern and out there as he could possibly play and still fit the background. And uh, is just an astounding, intense guy. And he has a one-man show that he does with a variety of banjos and guitars, and he sings a little bit. And uh, again, there's bluegrass in there, but he's gone way beyond bluegrass. I think we have a couple more. We have two. Ah, Steve Martin. <laughs> Steve Martin, when he was a kid, oddly enough, heard Earl Scruggs play the banjo and wanted to do that. And he did that. Another thing he wanted to do was magic and he learned to do magic. He lived in Southern California, and he got hired at Knott's Berry Farm and Disneyland to play the banjo, uh, to do magic, and he used the banjo to support his show. Kind of like Uncle Dave making a joke here, or a poem there, you know, play a little banjo, ha ha, wink wink, nudge nudge, you know. And he became known as the wild and crazy guy, but he always played the banjo. One of his great buddies was a fellow named John McEwen, who was in the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band, who made the great album in the 1970s, Will the Circle Be Unbroken? And between the two of them, he got into the bluegrass banjo world and has been well accepted. At first, people thought he was a dilettante, you know, he just fooling with the banjo, but he showed them he was serious. He has a bluegrass band out of Asheville, North Carolina, on retainer to do shows, and he does all the bluegrass shows he can possibly do. And in fact, one of his albums won Album of the Year and Entertainer of the Year from the Bluegrass Association. But, what, and Steve has learned to play both with the picks and the old claw hammer style. Another one who plays on the dark side, as I said. And we'll finish up with this young lady. Circle goes around. Her name is Rhiannon Giddens. She came to know, she's a fully university trained, classically trained, opera singer, but she also plays the banjo and the old time instruments and is reclaiming the black heritage for the banjo. She was in a band you may remember called the Carolina Chocolate Drops and they had tambourines and fiddles and guitars and multiple banjos and they played old songs and she uh, doing very well for herself. She has a new project going where all the Musicians are women, and I, I don't want to say too much about it except there, it's a reclaiming kind of. Women have a place with the banjo, uh, the banjo has a place with African Americans, and they're very proud of it. And, you know, got their elbows out a little bit. Like, we are reclaiming this instrument. Steve Martin, who you saw a minute ago, to prove his, not to prove, but because he really loves the banjo. 10 or 12 years ago, he set up a thing called the Steve Martin Prize for Excellence in Bluegrass Banjo, supported by a check for $50,000 given each year. Noam Pekelny won it, Bela Fleck won it, some JD uh, regular bluegrass pickers like Earl have won it. He has a jury, Earl Scruggs, Sonny Osborne, JD Crow, uh, Bela Fleck are on the jury, and every year they pick someone to give this prize to. Rhiannon Giddens won it last year for what she's doing to take the banjo back to where it came from. Just a wonderfully educated and wonderful music and when she sings, oh boy can she sing, but she can really play the banjo in all the styles. So I think that's the end of my slides and we're out of time, but I wanted to say just a couple other words. If you're interested in this history, there is a thing called the American Banjo Fraternity. They don't like what I've just done here. Way too sloppy, my facts are skewed. I'm not emphasizing the right things, but if you go online and look for American Banjo Fraternity, they have a convention every year. It's very much into the old side of the 1800s, both scholarship and performance. Also, if you're interested in more, 
There is a new resource online. It's at emerson.banjo.edu. That's Emerson College up in Massachusetts. Emerson.banjo.edu, where they have a number of these people that I've showed you do like three minute talks on video of their particular angle on the banjo. Rhiannon Giddens is in there. A number of other people. So if you want more, you can get it there. Uh, I think that's about it, uh, except to say, all around the company, uh, country now, there are camps set up for a week or a weekend where people go to learn the banjo. The next one is in uh, Charlton, Massachusetts. That's up by Worcester, and it's May 17 to 19. It's been going for, I don't know, almost 20 years now. All these people come with their banjos from novices who don't know how to pick it up out of the case to experts, and they have instructors from all over the country fly in, and you stay at a little conference center with a cafeteria and dormitory rooms, and you learn to play the banjo. And those take place all over the country. The banjo remains wildly popular, I would say, since about 1970. Old-time music has become, again, as interesting as the scrub style, and probably today more banjos are sold to old-time players than to bluegrass players. That doesn't mean bluegrass is going down. It means old-time music is coming up. However, the four-string banjos almost did. They got replaced by guitars, as I said. The Mummers Parade on New Year's Day in Philadelphia, you ever see that, where you got all these guys in these wild costumes going down the street, blasting away on these banjos? That's about the last place you can reliably see four-string banjo playing. And it's all about the show. It's not about the music. It's about the show. But bluegrass is very much alive, old-time music coming on strong, and the American banjo fraternity is preserving the stuff from the 1800s, the classical style, the minstrel style, the, the, even the pre-minstrel style. So banjo is a live thing. It's found a terrific home in bluegrass music because 1945, the five-string banjo was almost dead. Those four guys I put up there, the comedians, Uncle Dave, String Bean, Brother Oswald, Grandpa Jones, they're about the last guys, and they were comedians, entertainers. And thank God Earl Scruggs came along. The Gibson Company had given up making banjos. They weren't making any in night after World War II was over. For several years, didn't make any banjos. So finally, about 1954, there was enough interest because of Earl Scruggs, they started up making master tone banjos again. I'm sorry I went over time. Thank you for your patience.